in the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, O oh God, my rock and my salvation. Today's message is about the power of words. Today's message about the difference between function and intent. It's told against the backdrop of religious ritual, of what makes a person clean or unclean. It isn't the food you eat that's the problem. I mean, you digest that and poop it out. <laughs> but your words, dripping with negativity and attitude. Here we are told that is what makes you unclean. For those biting, cutting, sarcastic, insulting words which come from your mouth and reveal your heart is what makes you unclean, <coughs> dirty, even filthy. Scripture says, out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, left thine and jealousy. And washing your hands will not get rid of that kind of dirt. But here are the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, why do you, you and your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Because traditionally, when coming from the market, they would be expected to ceremoniously wash their hands. Now, the devout Pharisees are perfectly sincere in their ritual washings. They were making the common holy, acting on the belief that everything we do is somehow within the realm of God's mercy and guidance. In fact, in our day and time, we do a version of the same thing when we pray before we eat. For we believe prayer should undergird everything we do in life, and so many of us even pray before civic engagements, we pray before sports events and football games, tennis matches. So I don't want to be too hard on the Pharisees for wondering why some of Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before eating a meal. We need to understand why the Pharisees were so upset. You see, the Pharisees were protecting the religious norms and traditions of Israel. It would not be too much to claim that the Pharisees were protecting the very fabric of what they thought was the Israelite existence. Were they misguided at times? Were they a bit too zealous? Did they miss the world right in front of them? Yes, to all the above. In their enthusiasm to call Israel to be faithful and in their way of thinking, hold firm the very fabric of Jewish society, they became the keepers of the law, while missing out entirely on the spirit of the law. So what is at stake then is not just the specific practice, but the larger question of authority. In short, the Pharisees want to know just who does Jesus think he is to disregard the tradition of the elders? Can't you hear the Pharisees chanting, tradition, tradition? <laughs> but here, Jesus is challenging them as to how their traditions help them to fulfill their mission of serving God. How does their tradition help make the world more just and a peaceful place? Now, I want to stop right here because I think this is just where this week's scripture might shed some light on our shared life as a faith community, even as a nation. Okay, I mean, we don't seem quite as nitpicky about tradition as Jesus' opponents but what if I were to suggest tinkering with some of our own traditions? Perhaps 
changing worship in order to make worship more understandable and accessible to this current generation? Or what if we were to drop the lectionary in favor of moving through just a narrative of the Bible? Or what if we were to con cancel all committee meetings Yay. <laughs> in favor of a more nimble way of governing the congregation? Or what if we said we were going to get rid of all the cues to make the sanctuary a space that's more flexible so we could do more in the community? What if on the fourth Sunday we didn't even come to church at all? but we decided to engage in community service throughout the community. You get the idea. We each have traditions that are more than traditions. They are markers of what has been accepted as right or wrong, and those traditions give us a sense of stability. But this passage helps us to examine our traditions. Should we really hold them sacred? It begs the question, is this a symbol of the way we do things around here? Or is this helping to draw us closer to the holy? There are plenty of outward signs of religion that may look holy and well-meaning, but here Jesus is saying the inward marks of faith are what is most important. The Pharisees have concentrated so much on these external measures of religious practice that the internal markers of faith have been forgotten or worse yet even become stumbling blocks to the people of God being agents of both care and transformation. And Jesus comments on this tremendous gap between the Pharisees' external religious practice and their internal belief. Last week in our sermon, we talked about St. Paul talking to the Ephesians, and he makes a similar point when he tells us our fiercest struggle as Christians. We are fighting not against things seen, but what is unseen. He says in Ephesians, we're not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. And today's passage points us to a manifestation of the power of darkness another kind of darkness that worked to extinguish the light of Christ. Mm -hmm. Arrogance. For the worst struggles we face are sometimes the powers and principalities that reside within ourselves. When we face our own arrogance, our own greed, our own prejudice or violence, we are facing the unseen powers of evil that St. Paul was speaking of. But there is another power, another principality at work here that may be more fierce and more devastating than the rest. The power of fear. And fear is what the Pharisees are really feeling. Fear dressed as outrage. Though the tradition of washing hands had begun as, had begun as a sincere effort, a sacred ritual, by the time Jesus comes on the scene, a certain fear had set in. Their system of ritual and legal performance had grown so rigid that it had taken control of them. Everything they did hinged on the concern that if one part, if that tradition were broken, then the whole tradition would die out. And if the whole tradition died out, 
then maybe the whole faith would die out. Because fear does that to people. It turns minor concerns into obsessions. I believe that same fear deceives us, defiles us. We are afraid that if any part of our small system fails, then we will fail. You know, like the fear and horror that is gripped some when modern day gladiators choose not to stand for the national anthem. Or the outrage of those who choose to kneel when the anthem is being played. Or the disgust at women covering their heads and bodies instead of displaying them for all to gaze at. Some people respond like the Pharisees, what are you doing? You're destroying everything. We think it laughable that the Pharisees would pick at Jesus for not following hand washing exactly the way they prescribe. But don't we do the same thing sometimes? For this idea of what defiles us and who is leading others to do the same underlines many of our current religious and political discussions and debates. Upsetting the keepers of the law. Causing finger pointing and casting blame. Wanting them to wash their hands in red, white, and blue feeling defiled by those who would choose to kneel for justice, feeling defiled by those who would remind us what America is like for those outside the mainstream, living on the margins, as Langston Hughes said, saying it plain, America never was America to me. That expression has shaken the keepers of the law. I can hear them saying they have defiled us. Because for them, the re-examination of some of our traditions makes them afraid. And that fear can cause some to think, like the Pharisees, that American tradition is at stake. It's broken. Our national traditions are destined to die because fear distorts reality so that important concerns of our life are missed. Fear distorts the truth. The Reverend Samuel G. Chandler is Dean of the Cathedral of St. Philip in the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. He says this, fear also tricked the Pharisees into thinking that if they did proper external acts, then they would be made internally, inwardly clean. If they washed their hands before every meal, then nothing unclean would ever enter them. He says this same fear often drives us into an obsession with what goes into our lives. We try to censor everything that goes into our lives. We shelter ourselves. We try not to threaten ourselves. We try not to get dirty. We try to preserve the status quo. But maybe, he says, maybe our deepest fear is that our status quo is not so good anyway. Maybe, he says, our deepest fear is that there really is an uncleanliness, uncleanliness in us, and we are afraid to face it, end quote. So this text is not really about washing hands. It's about tradition and the authority behind that practice. That's why the Pharisees press. Why? Do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? 
implying that Jesus and his disciples are disregarding tradition and that puts them against every holy power that is, even against God. And here, Jesus calls them on their stuff. He says, you're so caught up in washing hands and how that defiles a person, you're missing the larger issue. What comes out of a person is what defiles a person. What comes out of a person, you will not replace us. What comes out of a person, grab another. What comes out of a person, immigrants are rapists and thieves. Jesus said, real sanctification comes from within. For out of the heart of people come evil thoughts, theft, wickedness, deceit, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. And the Pharisees are offended. They are champions of the law. Wash your hands, stand for the anthem, and uncover yourself. They are champions of appearances. They are experts of what foods defile you and what are the laws of acceptability. I know you've heard the expression, you are what you eat. But here Jesus is saying, you are what you speak. Jesus said in Matthew 12, we will give an account for every word we speak. Watching what we say is a spiritual discipline. And we have plenty of scripture to back that up. Proverbs 21 and 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Proverbs 13 and 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who, who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Yeah. Proverbs 10 and 19, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 17 and 27, he who has knowledge spares his words. And a man of understanding is of calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered per perceptive. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18 and 21. Scripture tells us over and over again that the best indicator of how close we are in our faith walk is what we say. Here we are told what makes us unclean is what comes out of our mouths. Because words do harm, words do defile, words do destroy the heart and spirit of people more than anything else. Words like stupid, fat, lazy, witch with a beat. I wish you'd never been born. I wish I'd never met you. What comes out of our mouths comes out of our hearts. And that can be a blessing or a curse. It can move us toward the holy, or it can send us spiraling into deep depression. So this week I want you to ask yourself, have I become defiled by what comes out of my mouth? Do you talk negatively about your health, your job, your finances, or even your family? I think we all do at some time. So here's the thing. You can be absorbed by outward appearances and that has its place. You can 
cling to tradition for tradition's sake, and that has its place. Or you can speak words of life and healing, acknowledging what comes out of your mouth reveals the content of your heart. That's why preachers say, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's why the hymnist wrote, give me a clean heart so I may serve thee. Lord, fix my heart so I may be used by thee. So here's the good news. We are not bound by tradition. In Christ, we have been given choices to reinterpret tradition. And we have been given authority to speak the Creator's words in the name of all that's holy. For we follow the one in whom the Word became flesh and lived among us. John tells us in the beginning, the Word existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word love. The Word justice. The Word reconciliation. The Word peace. The words let there be. Romans 10 and 8 says, The Word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. And that, people of God, will make us all fit to be used by God, even if our hands are dirty. Amen. Amen.